Hello. Is this the point where I start? Yes. Is that my, that's my cue to start? OK. Uh, I think I'll just stand. Hope you, sorry. Hi, guys. Good evening. Hi, Musa, my guy. Hi, <laughs> my guys. So um, welcome to my huddle. Yeah. So first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out here t um, this evening to do this with us, because this really means so much to the creative space and means so much to me right now, because this is something I really wanted to do this year. Well, I've been super busy, but I'm happy this is happening, irrespective of um, whatever I am doing. So, welcome to my huddle. And in six pictures and one audio tape, I'll be taking you on a very short journey through my experiences as man and as God. <laughs> I know that's a very bold statement, but yeah, you guys can deal with it later. Yeah, so this. Where is my audio? Okay, so I'm just going to swipe again because I need you guys to be immersed in the experience. Yeah, so yes, that's it. Was that me? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. I'm not used to this technology. <laughs> yeah, so this um, photographs and the and the um, audio tape actually represents different um, significant points in my life. Yeah, you'd notice pictures of um, the Ayo Olokmo, picture of the Egungu masquerade, picture of um, the Afia warlord, war dancers, picture of Ikoro. So Ikoro is a drum from my, my side. And um, yeah, the pre-colonial structure, yeah. So my name is Josh E.K. Egesi. The E.K., my middle name E.K. means strength. And the full pronunciation is actually Onyike, which means a strong person or, um, yeah, a strong person. Yeah, and I am a design artist. So I'm sure you guys have been wondering what it means to be a design artist. This is a term I just coined for myself because I struggled over the years trying to define myself because I never really thought of myself as a designer because I could do more than just design. And I never really thought of myself as just an artist because I felt like I had transcended oil on canvas. Yeah. So I thought of um, a definition or a tag that would work for me so I don't always have to introduce myself to people as um, a god because I tend to do that. You ask me, what are you, what do you do? And I just tell you, oh, I'm a god because it makes a lot of sense because God created everything and I feel like I can do anything. Yeah, so it's always easier for me to introduce myself to people as a god, but I cannot add that to my CV. <laughs> so it's best to just define myself as a design artist, yeah, because I create, because I design art and I make artistic designs. Yeah, so um, I asked Google what it means to be a design artist and Google didn't have any, defini any precise definition for me. They had definition for a designer, they had definition for an artist, but Google does not have a definition for a design artist. So I fed ChatGPT with um, some key pointers and told ChatGPT to define what it means to be a design artist, and this was what ChatGPT came up with. So a design artist is a creative professional who specializes in conceptualizing, crafting, and executing visual composition that blends aesthetics, functionality, and ex artistic expression. So this is me. This is what defines me. Because I can design, I can build, and I can just execute the entire thing. So how did we get to this point? 
It all started in the year 1992, when I was first born. <laughs> I say first born because in Nigeria, we've been born quite a number of times. I've been born again and again and again, especially if you grew up in the Pentecostal um, family. So it started in the year 1992. Hey, whoa. Yeah. So it started in the year 1992, and let's call this era the Egungu era. Yeah. I grew up in a, I was born in a very small town in Lagos, um, Ajegunle to be precise, yeah. And that was where I experienced African culture for the first time. And it was, Ajegunle had a very predominant uh, masquerade culture, as at that time when I was growing up, I don't know about now. They had this masquerade culture, and we'd always chase masquerades, and the masquerade would chase us, but the masquerade never stopped chasing me, because after chasing, me during the day, or chasing them and they chased me back during the day. They would always chase me at night in my dreams. Yeah, and this continues for a very long time. And because of the kind of family I was raised in, the only way out of this was, was um, by casting and binding. And there was no need for therapy. What are you talking about? Who's talking about therapy? Yeah. So, moving on to the first product I ever experienced as a child. Yeah. The Atuqua was the first product I ever experienced as a child. And this product is actually um, very significant because it has led to something that I'll be talking about later in the presentation. Yeah, so Atupa, this is the kerosene lantern. I'm sure a lot of people know what this is. Oh, sorry. Please. Yeah, so Atupa, the kerosene lantern was um, the first light, lighting objects I found in the house. This was our source of power supply. Not like we needed NEPA for any other thing, because we never had a TV, we never had a fridge, we never had a microwave, so there was no need to even charge a phone, because <laughs> it was 1990-something, yeah. So, Atuka was the first product I remember experiencing as a child. Moving on to 2000, let's call this era the era of indoctrination and self-discovery, yeah. In the year 2000, there, around 2000, my dad finally realized that, okay, he thinks we're missing out on, on culture of his own people. So he decided he would start taking us to the village every Christmas. And my, my dad is a very interesting person. So every Christmas, we'd travel with a double barrel gun, okay, get to the village, whatever we get, to, even if we get to the village, Around 12, 12 a.m. or 2 a.m. in the middle of the night, my dad would always pull out, pull out that gun and shoot in the air. By the next day, our compound would be filled with friends and foes, yeah, and they loved my dad. So, for the very first time, I was a part of this culture. So, I thought I had experienced culture, the Egungu culture in Lagos. But for the very first time, I experienced culture, and I was a part of this culture because I dressed like them, I was dressed like them, I learned to dance like them, I just experienced culture in its, its entirety. This is Ikoro. Ikoro is a festival that happens in my um, place. I'm from Abia State. Um, I make it him, to be precise. <laughs> yeah, so this is Ikoro. And I also experienced so many other culture. The Oafia war dancers, I actually love these guys. Uh, growing up, I used to see these guys pop their chest. Yeah, but I, I, could, I couldn't really do much with my chest because I was just a child. child. There was no Akbobi to, to pop. Yeah, so I just admired them. And these memories actually stayed in my head for a very long time, and they still do. Sometimes I just go on YouTube and play Oafia war, war songs because I really enjoy them. In the year 2008, it was called this year, this era, the era of art education. So it was, I was in two, uh, SS3 in 2008, yeah, and I was the best student, the best art student in my secondary school. And my parents were, were also very supportive. They wanted me to be an artist. That's not something you find in other homes. They really wanted me to be an artist. My dad even promised I was going to get me a canvas and oil paint to paint his portrait. But that never happened because he died this same year. And 2009, I had to go to um, a polytechnic, Aochi Polytechnic. 
in our Triple E Technics, I studied art and industrial design. It's interesting that I've seen I studied art and industrial design now because I didn't know I studied art and industrial design. <laughs> Like, I, no, I knew I studied art and industrial design, but I never really realized that I studied art and industrial design when I started doing industrial design. It was later, I was like, ah, guy, you actually studied art and industrial design, so that's something you can add to your CV. And yeah, so after our trip polytechnic, I went to University of Benin, studied um, fine and applied art, majored in painting. And yeah, it was actually in University of Benin, I met Jordan Belong. So Jordan, Fun fact, Jordan was my inspiration to start doing graphic design. Yeah, when we were in uni, I would always look at what Jordan was doing. And like, we were in the same church fellowship, um, school fellowship. Yeah, and Jordan would do cool design, and I wanted to do the same thing. And so I learned from Jordan, learned from the baddest in the industry. Yeah, so I went to the University of Benin, studied arts, um, painting, ma majored in painting, then graduated in 2016. And then we move on to, wait, before I move on to the next slide, I need you guys to understand why I am going over these slides, over these different times, yeah? Because these are the things that have influenced my um, practice as a designer or as an artist, yeah? And these are the things that are going to, are most likely going to shape whatever I'm going to be building in the future. So I just think it's very important you guys know why I, design, why I design, the way I design, and what I'm going to be designing in the future, if you can figure that out. So, 2017. Let's call this era the era of fame and absolute chaos. Yeah. I graduated from the University of Benin in 2016. 2017, I was in, um, I was in one wood market on the mainland, around Orile. I was just there doing my thing, buying wood to make stretchers for, um, for painting. And then I just, my phone just started beeping. I started getting lots of messages. And what was happening? Someone said, oh, Instablog Ninja posted my stuff. And I was like, I just checked. And this was what I found. So I had made a portrait in, a portrait in my university, which was my final year pro project. Yeah, I made a portrait with bottle covers. Yeah, and after like, I think, four months of graduating, I decided to just post it on Instagram, just so people can see. And then someone saw it and was like, "Oh, Josh, is this the stuff you were asking me?" So, because I wanted to get bottle covers from her in Worry, and so she referenced it and she was like, "Oh, she can help me. She can. She's just going to tag some people." And then she tagged the people that she tagged, and we became famous. I was everywhere. I was jumping from one news platform to another. I was in a newspaper. My family were so proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> they were so proud of me. I was so proud of myself. I would see myself in this day newspaper, Punch newspaper everywhere, CNN. I was like, oh, my, we, are, we are blown. But yeah, this, this really, this never yielded anything after all this, this, this um, paparazzi. Yeah, that's why I call it the year of um, fame and absolute chaos, because I never really knew what to do with this popularity. Yeah, I was so confused. I got tired at some point, because all these press platforms would always ask the same question. And I got frustrated. And I think after a year, I decided to just stay indoors, because every time I step outside, someone is always like, oh, Josh, you, yeah. Yeah, what to cover? Like, and it was annoying. <laughs> it was annoying because the, the, that wasn't the plan. The plan was to do this thing and then do other things. Yeah, but people started telling me things like, oh, you should really do this, continue doing this. And I'm like, bro, no, I'm not about to live the rest of my life doing what to cover portraits. Like, that's so basic. Yeah, but it felt, people thought it was fascinating. Well, I don't know. So I got discovered by Coca-Cola, and they commissioned me to do a portrait, the portrait of this guy, and also did the portrait of their um, Coca-Cola World CEO. And I got paid, in, well, I got paid decently <laughs> for my age. <laughs> so that time, if I'll be charging them now, I'd be charging them so much more money. But yeah, that's my era of fame and absolute chaos. Yeah, 2019. At this point, yeah, I got tired of doing slides. 
That's why I don't have 2019 in bold caps and doing that flip thing. I just got tired. So 2019, um, I, I was tired of doing basic things. Yeah, I'd, be, I'd been a graphic designer, I'd been an in art instructor, been everything, but I was so bored. Like there was nothing that was really working for me. Yeah, so I got a call from um, Imaginarium, a creative agency, and they asked if I would like to consult on a project. And the project was super interesting. It was a project that had to do with culture, it had to do with everything I wanted to do. Yeah, so on this project, I was a designer, I was an architect, I was um, a product designer, I was everything on this project. And this is one of the most fascinating things I did um, at the project. In CBD, symbols, in CBD mural on the wall. Yeah, this actually took me back and made me realize so many things. Yeah. There are so many things that we don't, um, we don't know about our culture in Nigeria. And I feel like with this project, I got, um, I got super interested in culture. And I thought it was about that time I started doing something in, in that line. So yeah, these are NCBD symbols. I had to study in CBD for a while to understand the symbols. So these are not just random scribblings on the wall. Every symbol on this wall means something that is relevant to the building. This building has um, a museum, has um, an I ICT center, has a restaurant, has a library, has everything. And this is one of my, uh, one of the projects I'm super proud of. So, Let's now get to the main this thing, the case study. Yeah, what I am currently doing and how I function. So we're starting with um, the Ikenna tripod fan. Yeah, this product was actually one of the was not one of. It's actually the first product I um, I made. Yeah, and I made it. Um, on that IBAJ project, yeah, I made this like. Hmm. I like to go on a commercial break before I start stuttering. Thank you guys. My throat's not dry. <laughs> I don't know how you guys do this presentation thing, but. Yeah, so Ikenna Vintage, uh, sorry, Ikenna um, Tripod Fan. Yeah, so I was on the Ibaje project and I had finished designing the place and we needed to put something, we needed to buy, fan, buy fans for the space, but every fan I saw, I saw in the market never really worked for this space and I wanted something different, wanted something that worked with the aesthetic of the space. So I went on Pinterest and searched for um, interesting fan designs. And I saw tripod fans and I thought they were really interesting. So I decided to design my own tripod fan. The first design was, was, was dead, yeah. Very, very dead. I don't know how people paid for that, that thing. <laughs> but I really sold. <laughs> I sold a lot actually. Yeah, pe but people, I, th I just think people just wanted to support me because that design was, was dead. So since, since the first design, I've designed like, I've redesigned this product like two times. This is the third time I am designing the product. And I think for the first time, I paid attention to a lot of the um, economics. Is, it, is that the right word? I paid attention to a lot of things in the product. And a lot of the products, I, the tripod fan I saw on Pinterest, would always have this um, anchor point in the middle. And I thought that was, that, was, that was disturbing to me. I just felt like there should be a way around this thing. And I tried several designs and finally landed this, um, this design. Let me see. OK, yeah. So the way the stand is designed is designed in a way, I mean, that sounds like tautology. But anyways, <laughs> yeah, the fan is designed in a way that this groove in the tripod stand actually anchors um, at a 15 degree angle so the fan doesn't slide out of place. Oh.
Actually, one of the fan here. I don't know why they're hiding it. Yeah, so it it's anchors in a way that it doesn't slide out of place. And I just felt like, oh, this is something I should actually patent because this is not out there. Um, everybody I've seen design this, this tripod would only anchor the, um, the fan in the middle. And fun fact about this fan, when I was younger, product, the first product I ever designed as a, not designed, I was just playing as a kid. Yeah, the first thing I ever made as a kid was um, a fan. Yeah, and this is why I said in the beginning that I'm going to be talking about the spirituality of design. Yeah, talking about how something I did like so many years uh, is now something I am doing now, and this is something that has been re reoccurring in my my practice. Yeah. I just do something and then realize that, oh, I did this so many years ago, and it just makes everything make sense. Like, it feels more spiritual than, than it's just one ordinary product. Yeah. So the first thing I ever made as a kid was a fan, and so many years later, oh, jeez, I sh <laughs> Sorry. I should have removed this picture. It looks weird on a big screen. <laughs> I'm just seeing it now. Yeah, so the first thing I ever designed was a fan, and so many years later, I designed um, a fan. And these are pictures of the fan. Yeah, so Ikoku Floor Lamp is the second product I designed. Yeah, A lot of people that bought the fan thought the fan was super cool, and they wanted me to design something that complemented the fan. Because a lot of people just buy the fan, put it on one side of their TV console, and they wanted something to complement it on the other side. And I thought, okay, why not design a floor lamp? Yeah. And I searched for inspirations, and what um, stood out for me, because I always dive back into nostalgia and try to draw inspiration from there. So what, um, what I decided to draw inspiration from was the Atupa, the lantern. And I used this because it holds so many memories. And whenever I share it with people, oh, this is the inspiration behind the, you know, the floor lamp, yeah, they tend not to even focus on the floor lamp itself. And people just start sharing their different stories about growing up and breaking the, the glass and getting whipped, whooped for breaking it. And, I, I just thought it was interesting to share those conversations. And yeah, I built it and had the exhibition. And yeah, this is it. My third project, product is the IO bench. I feel like there are so many conversations around this IO bench. Yeah, everybody has their own opinion. Um, around it, and I really appreciate the fact that people get to talk about my piece internationally, and people get to share their observation. Yeah. The IO Bench is actually in two series. This is the series two um, design. The first design is actually wooden, and the idea behind making a wooden bench um, and incorporating game on the end um, was because growing up, yeah, I would always see people trip over this um, bench. I don't know if you guys recognize this bench. Yeah, we used to have this bench in my compound, in my Face Me I Slap You compound. <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah, it was funny then that whenever someone stands up from one end, the other person would trip over. Yeah, so for me, I just thought it was important for me to solve the problem of balance. Yeah, so I incorporated the IO game on one end and the magazine order on the other end so that nobody has to sit on any on either end of the of the bench. But this IO bench now developed into something um, something more important. These are pictures of the wooden IO bench. Yeah, you can see the details, like I pay attention to details guys, like I love it. <laughs> Yeah, so now this now developed into um, the IO Bench Series 2. Yeah, I wanted, 
This is actually very important to me because of the way it came about. It's just so many layers of um, experiences. Like I started out storing things inside a glass jar. Like I would always store wood, wood chips inside a glass jar. And every time I look at these wood chips inside a glass jar, I just thought they were really interesting. And I never really knew what I wanted to do with it. I just thought, oh, this, this looks cool. Yep. So one day, um, I was just scrolling through YouTube. Was it YouTube or Instagram? And I saw um, a speech by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She was talking about the restitution of African artifacts, and she described something that st stayed with me. She described our works as being kept in cold and clinical glass barrier-ish. That's our artifacts as being kept in cold and clinical glass barrier. And that was when it struck me that this could actually be it. Yeah. It was still around, it was around the same time I got selected for an exhibition in Milan, Design um, Salone del Mobile, Milan Design Week, and I never really had any idea what to do. So when I saw that video, I was like, yeah, this is it. This is the moment, this is the moment I've been waiting for, and this whole thing now makes sense. So I thought I was going to represent um, the artifacts with the IO and use the glass preserve the wood so with the glass, the cold, cold and clinical glass barrier. And it made so much, and it made, <laughs> and it made so much sense to me. Yeah. And so many people have defined this in different ways, and I thought it was so beautiful to have so many people sharing their experiences with this. And um, I guess this is the point where I stopped talking because I am exhausted. <laughs> but yeah, these are my works. This is what I do. I am a design artist. And one of the reasons why I said I'm a design artist is because I like my works to express art as much as it expresses design, as you can see in this piece. So yeah, thank you. Oh. Thank you.